Hello and welcome to this video. My name is Will Billingsley and in this video I'd like to tell you a little bit about currents, voltages and resistances and I would like to start with a single charged particle. There it is, beautifully drawn on my screen there. You can tell this one's a positive charge by the fact that I've drawn a plus inside my hasty green circle but just in case that's not clear here we go, a positively charged particle. Some of you might be screaming at the screen by now. I will come back a little bit later on to the question of this particle being positively charged. But in the meantime, let's make my charged particle move. There it goes, zipping round in a clockwise direction. And that is a positive charge traveling in a clockwise direction. So that means it is a positive current in a clockwise direction. Currents are made up of charges moving. Uh, typically currents are made up of lots of charged particles moving, but it's probably easiest if I start by explaining it with one. So far so good. Positive charges moving in a clockwise direction is positive current in a clockwise direction. But there's a snag. You see, Back when scientists were discovering uh, currents and electricities and describing them in the 17 and 1800s, they were largely doing it before they knew what the charged particles that were doing the moving were. Now, in most electronic circuits, the charged particle that moves is an electron. And, well, lots of electrons. And electrons were discovered in 1897 by J.J. Thompson, and electrons are charged particles that have a negative charge. Hmm, okay. Slight snag, never mind, we can still make our negatively charged particles, our negatively charged electrons, move. Let's make this negatively charged electron move in an anti-clockwise direction. Electrons have a negative charge and there it goes zipping round in an anti-clockwise direction. Now, if I was to describe that electron travelling in an anti-clockwise direction as being a current in an anti-clockwise direction, well it has a negative charge so the magnitude of the current would also be negative. That would be a negative current travelling in an anti-clockwise direction. Now I don't know about you but I don't always like to think about negative currents. Uh, so what we could do is describe, you know what, we're going to talk about abstract currents in our circuits. And what we're going to say is that that negative current in an anti-clockwise direction is equivalent to a positive current in a clockwise direction. So we can describe our currents as being positive and in this case we have a positive current traveling in a clockwise direction and then just remember at the back of our heads that actually it's really negatively charged electrons going in the other direction. So, little take-home message from that short part there. Electrons moving to the right, well, electrons have a negative charge, so that would be a negative current to the right. But if we're talking about abstract currents, and usually we are, uh, we can think of that as being equivalent to positive current flowing to the left. Okay, let's move on from that question and consider the question of what makes these charges move. Now, for this part, I'd like to use a little bit of an analogy. I would like you to imagine that you are standing out in a field holding a weight above the ground. You and the weight are standing in a gravitational field, the gravitational pull of the Earth, and if you were to drop that weight in that gravitational field, it would plummet to the ground, wump, like so. Now, this suggests that that gravitational field is imbuing that weight with some potential energy. Um, I haven't said how heavy the weight is, so I've just talked about potential here. Uh, potential energy per unit mass, let's say. And that potential energy that that weight holds uh, is the difference between the, um, the potential energy between where it's moving from and where it's moving to. So it has some potential energy where you're holding it up and as you let go of it, that potential energy gets turned into kinetic energy as it accelerates towards the ground and goes wump on the ground next to your feet. 
Uh, now I said it depends on where it's moving from and where it's moving to. We're probably not so interested in the potential energy between that weight and the centre of the Earth because it can't get to the centre of the Earth. So I'd now like you to imagine that instead of standing on the ground uh, out in this nice grassy field, instead you are standing on the first floor of a big barn. In this case, as you hold the weight up, the potential energy difference that you care about probably isn't between the weight where it is uh, now and all the way down to the grassy field below, because you can only drop it as far as the floor you're standing on. And so the potential energy difference you care about is between where you're holding it up and the floor by your feet, and you let it go and it goes whump. Okay, so that is my analogy. I'd now like to go back to charged particles in space. And again, I'm going to talk about an abstract, positively charged particle. Uh, and just remember later on that it's really most often negatively charged particles moving in the other direction because often we're talking about electrons. So this negative, uh, sorry, this positively charged particle uh, sitting in space, instead of applying a gravitational field to it, I'm going to apply an electrical field to it. Now, this electrical field is going to apply an electromotive force. It's going to start trying to move that charge. And so this suggests that instead of there being some gravitational potential energy, there is an electrical potential energy uh, that this charge has. And there is an electrical potential energy difference uh, between where it is now and where it's travelling to. And, well, I haven't said how how big that charge is. So let's describe that potential difference uh, per unit charge. So let's describe it as the, um, the potential energy per unit charge from where it was minus the potential energy per unit charge of where it's going to. And let's call that the potential difference. And I've just drawn a line showing where it was going to. And there's a funny little symbol I've drawn on the bottom right hand side of that line, uh, which is the symbol for ground or earth. And so that is me suggesting. And so this potential here, that is the electrical potential of the surface of the earth. We do that sometimes. We do that if our circuits are connected to the Earth. Sometimes they are. Um, but you might realise, of course, that also you, you, you may have a mobile phone in your pocket and your mobile phone has electrical circuits in it that are not connected to the Earth. Um, so there's still potential differences going on inside the circuitry. Uh, and there is probably some point in that circuit that the circuit designer said, uh, let's just call that ground so that I can talk about potential differences relative to that point. So sometimes we will talk about grounded circuit. The ground point is actually connected to the Earth and it is the electrical potential of the surface of the Earth. Uh, sometimes we will just talk about, OK, and we're calling this point in the circuit ground, often the negative terminal of the battery. OK, so where do we get these potential differences from? Well, in a lot of circuits, it is from a battery. So here is my rough drawing of a AAA battery, 1.5 volts. It has a positive terminal. It has a negative terminal. Let's go and attach wires to those positive terminals and negative terminals. And now we have these two points that I can connect stuff to over here. And there is a potential difference of 1.5 volts between them. Potential differences are measured in volts. And so sometimes we call them a voltage. Now, if I was to connect a component across those two points, let's not worry just yet about what the component is. Let's just connect a component across them. That potential difference would set up an electrical field inside the component that I've just connected. That electrical field inside the component I've just connected would start to exert an electromotive force on charges inside that component and it would start moving charges and moving charges is current, current would flow. Current would flow from the positive terminal of the battery through my component and around to the negative terminal of my battery. Now, remembering that I am talking about an abstract positive current there, but this is an electronic circuit. And so most often that is going to be negatively charged electrons flowing in the opposite direction. But we don't like to think too much about the negatively charged electrons. So we're just going to call that an abstract positive current flowing through my component there. OK. Summary so far, 
We've got current, which is charges moving. I haven't told you this yet, but current is measured in amps. And that's a big capital A for that symbol. And that current in electronic circuits, a positive current is really often electrons moving in the opposite direction, negatively charged uh, electrons traveling against the current. And there is this idea of a potential difference and potential differences are measured in volts. And so they're also called a voltage. And so that's what we've got so far. Now, let's next consider the question of resistance. And this is the question of, OK, I connect a component across my potential difference. How much current is going to flow? For this, I'd like to use another analogy. For this one, I would like you to imagine a computer scientist who, for some irrational reason, has a particular love of sliding down slippery slides. And so here he is, and he's on his slippery slide, and he is at a certain height, and so has some amount of gravitational potential energy. And as he goes wee down that slide, uh, it gets turned into kinetic energy, and he has all sorts of fun sliding down that slippery slide. Uh, now I'm going to do something not so fun. I'm going to replace that slippery slide with a rough brown carpet. Our poor computer scientist, as he slides down this rough brown carpet, he's probably not going to slide as fast and there's going to be some friction between him and the carpet. And that friction is going to turn some of his kinetic energy into heat and he is quite likely to end up with friction burn, carpet burn. OK, so what am I trying to get at from this analogy? Well, we have this friction and for the same height, the same uh, potential energy difference where he was going from and to, uh, well, he moved more slowly because of that friction and some of the energy was converted into a different form, heat, the heat that gave him the carpet burn. So that is my analogy. And I'm now going to come back to my electric circuit. So here is my battery with these two wires hanging off it and these two terminals that I can connect a component across. And the component that I'm going to connect across them is called a resistor. And let's say this resistor has a resistance of one ohm. Resistance is measured in ohms and that is a, uh, an omega is the, is the symbol for it. Uh, well, if there is a potential difference of 1.5 volts and a resistance of 1 ohm, then 1.5 amps of current will flow. Now, 1.5 amps of current is actually pretty big for an electronic circuit. For electrical circuits around the house, uh, it might be fine. Vacuum cleaners may take some number of amps, washing machines and so forth. Uh, but little electronic circuits would tend to have smaller currents than that. So let's instead say that this resistor is one kilo ohm, one kilo ohm, 1000 ohms. And so now with 1.5 volts and 1000 ohm, that's that's going to lead to a current of 1.5 milliamps, 1.5 one thousandths of an amp. So you can probably see the, um, the relationship uh, building up here. And so the relationship is called Ohm's law. And it says that uh, V equals I times R. So the potential difference, the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. Why that? Well, it's pretty much how resistance is defined. Resistance is the ratio between the potential difference, the voltage and the current uh, that ends up flowing as a result of that. So this is the first of the circuit laws that I'm going to introduce. This one is Ohm's law. And I'm going to introduce you to two more circuit laws. Now, for the next one, I would like to ask you this question. What is the potential difference between this point, and I just picked the positive terminal of the battery arbitrarily, uh, between this point and itself? You might be screaming at the screen right now going, what do you mean? What the, what's the potential difference between it and itself? It is itself. The difference between it and itself must be zero. And you'd be right. The potential difference between that point and itself is zero. Now, I'd like you to hold hold that thought in your head and I'm going to remove my little drawing of a voltmeter with two clips hanging off it. And instead, I am going to draw a line all the way around the circuit. The potential difference between that point and itself is still zero. So that means as we go all the way around the circuit, the potential difference around the whole loop must add up to zero. And that is what's called Kirchhoff's 
voltage law. The algebraic sum of all the voltages around any closed loop in a circuit is zero. Another way to think about it, let's start off this time at the negative terminal of the battery, of that voltage source. As we travel up through the negative terminal, uh, the battery to the positive terminal, we gain 5 volts because that is a voltage source. We travel around the circuit clockwise and we come down through the resistor. Well, if we've gone up 5 volts through the voltage source, we must go down 5 volts through the resistor. Uh, and then we come round and get back to where we started. So that is Kirchhoff's voltage law. The algebraic sum of the voltages around any closed loop in a circuit is zero. Second law down. Third law. The third one, I'd like to use another analogy. For this one, called Kirchhoff's current law, I would like you to imagine a junction between two one-way streets. Now, I'm going to ask you to imagine, uh, to think about that little square of tarmac that is the junction where these two, exactly where they meet. Now, there's three stretches of tarmac coming off this. There's the stretch of tarmac coming from the north into the junction. There's the stretch of tarmac coming from the east into the junction. And there is the stretch of tarmac coming from the south into the junction. Now, remember, this is a one-way street. And so actually, really, cars are going to be coming out of that junction. But for the moment, I've, I'm talking about the flow of cars into the junction from that stretch to the south. So cars coming out of the junction traveling south would be a negative flow of cars into the junction from the south. And what we're going to say is that at steady state, we don't see cars stacking up on top of each other in that little rectangle of tarmac in the middle of the road. So at steady state, uh, the sum of these three flows of cars must be zero. It can't be less than zero because otherwise we'd have to have cars popping out of thin air in the junction to keep traveling south. Um, so at steady state, the flow of cars from these three flows, the sum of these three flows must be zero. Um, I keep saying at steady state. When the junction is flowing, we might see lots of cars coming along from C1 and lots of cars coming along from C2, and that is balanced by the cars coming out in C3. Suppose a car breaks down in the middle of the junction. Imagine a traffic jam, because you're probably thinking, no, 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 hang on, sometimes we can get there not being a flow of cars. OK, a car breaks down in the middle of the traffic jam. What happens? Well, cars can't get into the junction from C1. Cars can't get into the junction from C2. And cars can't get out of the junction from, from C3. So in that case, it still all adds up to zero. It's just that in that case, all the flows themselves are also zero. Nothing's going anywhere uh, inside that junction. But so at steady state, the flow of cars, the sum, total sum of the flows of cars into that junction must be zero. Kirchhoff's current law is the same thing for current. If we imagine these three wires meeting at a point and we draw the currents all flowing into that node, then the sum of those currents at steady state must be zero. The currents got to go somewhere. If I1 and I2 are positive, those currents are positive. Well, it's got to be balanced by I3 being negative. The, those two currents coming in have to be balanced by I3 being a current going out. OK, so that is Kirchhoff's current law. The sum of all currents meeting at a point is zero. The flow of currents in is balanced by the flow of currents out. Now that I've taught you those three laws, I'm going to do a little bit of maths with them on a special kind of circuit. And then afterwards, I'm going to explain how in digital electronics, we don't actually always think too in too much detail about the maths, but we'll go through a little bit of maths on it. Now, the circuit that I want to show you is called a voltage divider, and it looks a bit like the circuit we had before, where we've got a battery on the left and we've got a resistor on the right. But in this case, I've got two resistors on the right, and that means there is a point between them. And so that means I can consider the current in resistor 1 and the current in resistor 2. And I can consider the voltage across resistor 1 between that point in the middle and the positive terminal of the battery. And I can consider the, the voltage across resistor 2, the voltage between the negative terminal of the battery and that point between the two resistors.
Now, let's first of all write down some things that we can say from our three circuit laws. And so let's just write them down on the right and then I'll talk through them. Well, the first thing we can say is if we consider Kirchhoff's current law, KCL, I've written it down as, that current that's traveling through resistor one and going to that point between them, it's got to go somewhere. And the only place it can go is through resistor two. So I1 must be the same as I2. The current into that node in the middle must be balanced by the current out of that node in the middle. OK, so far so good. Now let's consider Kirchhoff's voltage law. Well, if on the left hand side we go up five volts as we travel up through the um, through the voltage source, through the battery, then on the right hand side we must go down five volts. And so the uh, the sum of V1 and V2 must be five volts to balance the five volts that we went up through the voltage source on the left. OK, so V1 plus V2 is five volts and that's Kirchhoff's voltage law, KVL I've written in the brackets. And the last bit I've written down the bottom is Ohm's law, which is pretty much the definition of resistance. And I've just written that down for each of the resistors. So I1 times R1 is equal to V1. I2 times R2 is equal to V2. Now that I've written those down, let's do a little bit of simplifying. And the first thing I'm going to say is, look, if I1 is I2, I'm not going to bother saying I1 separately to I2. I'm just going to call that I. So let's get rid of I1 and I2 and let's just call that I. And so that means down the bottom on Ohm's law, I've now said I times R1 is V1 and I times R2 is V2 because the current in those two resistors is the same. Next, let's take that, well, V1 is I times R1 and V 2 is I times R2 and let's substitute that into the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation and so we get I times R1 plus I times R2 is 5 volts. Let's take the I outside the brackets so we get I times R1 plus R2 is 5 volts take the R1 plus R2 uh, over the other side and we end up with I is equal to 5 volts divided by R1 plus R2 so the amount that flows um, reduces as the resistance of R1 plus R2 goes up. And that makes sense. If it's bigger resistance, it's going to make less current flow. Down the bottom, we've still got I R1 is equal to V1. I R2 is equal to V2. I'm just going to divide V1 by V2. And so that should be the same thing as dividing I times R1 by I times R2. So if I times R1 equals V1 and I times R2 equals V2, then I times R1 divided by I times R2 is equal to V1 over V2. On the left, I've got an I on the top and I've got an I on the bottom. So I'm just going to cancel those out. And so that now says R1 divided by R2 is equal to V1 divided by V2. And let's clear away the blue and let's kind of write the, OK, what can we say from this then? So this kind of circuit is called a voltage divider and the top part, the current is 5 volts divided by R1 plus R2, means I can control how much current flows in this circuit by how big I pick those two resistors as being. Uh, what R1 plus R2 is. If I pick big resistors, not so much current will flow. If I pick little resistors, more current will flow. And if I take that point P between the resistors, uh, that point between the resistors, and I attach a wire to it and I call it P, then I can control the voltage between that point P and the negative terminal of the battery by the ratio of the two resistors that I pick. So R1 divided by R2 is equal to V1 uh, divided by V2. And so if I pick uh, depending on what values of R1 and R2 I pick, uh, which one is bigger than the other, I can control whether that uh, uh, voltage at P is higher or lower. OK, that was the maths of it. I'd now like to describe how in digital electronics we possibly don't care exactly about the details of the equation and the exact resistances and voltages. So. The thing is, let's take the equations away. Let's say we've got this circuit and we've got five volts on the left and we've got R1 and we've got R2 and we've got our point P and we're interested in what the voltage is between point P and the negative terminal of the battery, which I have labeled ground. So VP here. 
let's just imagine what happens if R1 is huge, if R1 goes to infinity and R2 goes to zero. Well, if R1 goes to infinity, that's a bit like not having a component connected across there at all, like there's an air gap, an infinite resistance, no current can flow between these two points. And if R2 is super, super small, if R2 is almost zero, that's a bit like just having a wire connecting P down to ground on the negative terminal of the battery. And so as I look at this circuit, OK, if R1 is infinite and R2 is zero, that looks like P is not connected at all to the top end of the battery and P is connected by a wire to the negative terminal. So the voltage between P and the negative terminal, well, it's connected by a wire. There's going to be no voltage difference between them. VP is going to be zero. And let's do this the other way around. Let's set R1 to be almost zero and R2 to be almost infinite. Well, in this case, it looks like P is connected by a wire to the top of the battery and it's not connected at all to the bottom of the battery. And that's a five volt battery. So if P is connected to the top of the battery, it's going to be at five volts. And so this is where I'm trying to get the message across that when we go uh, into digital electronics, we often don't care about the exact value, exactly what voltage is VP. We care about, well, is it high or is it low? And we care about whether the resistance is very, very high or very, very low. And we care about whether the voltage is close to the positive uh, voltage in the circuit, five volts in those examples, or whether it's close to zero, the negative uh, uh, terminal of the battery in that case. We just don't want it to be somewhere in the middle. OK, so that is my whirlwind introduction to currents, uh, voltages and resistances. And so I would just like to say thank you for listening, thank you for watching, and goodbye for now.